Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Ferris Musa. Thanks for being on the show, Ferris. Hey, Whitney. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, honored to have you on the show. I know we've talked numerous times in a mastermind that we're both in, and then it's been great to see, uh, you know, just your all's growth and progress, you know, over the last little bit. I know we've had Ben, uh, your partner on the show as well. And uh, But a little about Ferris. He's an entrepreneur at heart with a tech background, graduated from the University of Texas with a computer science degree and worked at Microsoft straight from college. Ferris later quit Microsoft to bring tech uh, to the industries. Uh, uh, that like it, where uh, later he found his passion for real estate. Started with rentals and had nine closings in his first 12 months. That's that's impressive no matter what kind of asset class you're in. And um, then decided to scale up into apartment comp complexes where he met his business partner, Ben, and started Disrupt Equity, a company focused on multifamily acquisitions and investments for investors. So, Ferris, thank you again for your time and being willing to come on and share your expertise with the listeners. Tell them a little more about just who you are, what you all are working on right now, and, and let's dive in. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I know it took us a little bit longer to kind of get this scheduled. I know we both kind of <laughs> seem to have some things going on family-wise, but... uh yeah, so I mean, a little bit about myself, Disrupt Equity, you know, we focus primarily on just large apartment syndications, right? Anything from 100 to 400 units is kind of our sweet spot. It's more about the price range, right? I think people really fixate on the units, but to me, it's more about what price points are we comfortable with, right? And that includes, you know, how do you structure the debt to how do you raise the equity? And so for us, I mean, I'd say our sweet spot is in that 10 to $50 million range. And now, like I tell anyone, I mean, a good, if a good deal is a good deal, it doesn't matter if it's an $80 million deal. I mean, we're happy to get involved. And, you know, we know enough people, right, like yourself, Whitney, we can all, you know, it's a team sport. And so we can all kind of get together and get the deal going. So, you know, for us, I mean, you know, we're, we're primarily, we're based in Houston. Um, you know, our team's in, everyone in our team is in Texas so far and looking to continue scaling in 2020. So. Nice. So you said, uh, you know, 10 to $50 million range, uh, you know, so I think there would be a listener that would say, well, if you can do a $50 million deal, why would you waste your time looking and analyzing, going through the process with a $10 million deal? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, it's about deal flow, right? I mean, so for us, you know, we left Texas. So obviously we're based in Texas. The funny thing I tell everyone is we don't own a single deal in Houston. There is no yield for us to find in Houston. It's not to say people aren't doing deals. But for us and kind of what our equity is looking for as well as what we're looking for in terms of comfort of being able to perform, right? We just haven't been able to find enough meat on the bone in these Houston deals. And Houston's a little bit of a weird market, right? Where for those of you that don't know, you know, oil had a big recession in the 80s and 90s, right? And so during the 80s and 90s, nothing got built in Houston. There was pretty much a moratorium on new construction. So Houston has an overbuild of A-class, right? All the stuff that built the past 10 to 15 years has a lot of C's, which I, I like to call it lipstick on a pig two or three times over. There's not that B product. And so you have C's that trade like B's. And so, you know, we don't own anything in Houston and we left Texas really, you know, two years ago to get into Atlanta. And um, because it was a market that we liked the fundamentals, a good growth market, we knew, you know, population growth, job growth, and the price points were there. So, you know, that's what got us into Atlanta. And since then, you know, we're having to start to look for other markets. And so to get back to your question, it's really about deal flow. Right. I mean, we it's if I can find four $10 million deals, but I can't find a single $50 million deal, I'm going to go for that 10. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do we because different deals have different characteristics. And so. No, I like that. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to know just, uh, you know, I'd like for us to dive into just how you all run acquisitions a little bit. I think that's yeah. part of your specialty. And us Absolutely. So, I mean, for us, it's, you know, a couple of things, right? First and foremost, you hear this misnomer about off-market deals, right? And I think a lot of people really like to brag, oh, it's an off-market deal. I don't buy it, right? I mean, this day and age, any real deal is going through a broker because as a seller, right, we sold two deals, last, you know, this last quarter. As a seller, it's almost reckless for me to not use a broker, right? Because that extra one to two percent that the broker's going to make, they will get me ten percent more in you know in, in in price. And so everything is going through a broker, one facet or another, right? I mean, unless you're talking you know sub fifty unit deals. And so, you know, first and foremost, it's about knowing the brokers and respecting the brokers, right? And now it's not to say that every deal gets blasted widely, right? And so that's what an off-market deal really is. It's that it's not that a broker hasn't seen it. It's the broker's working with you. There is still a broker involved, 
but they are, you know, kind of picking their, their, their horses of who they want to show it to. And so, I mean, we, what, four of the last, sorry, three of the last four deals we did last year, we got through, you know, those means, whether it wasn't marketed widely or it was a deal that was marketed widely, seller or a buyer couldn't perform. And then we're the first guys that got the call. So, you know, so first and foremost, it's just, you know, knowing the brokers, getting their credibility. And, you know, I take notes on all my brokers, how many kids they have, what their kids are. I had a broker, you know, that just had a newborn three weeks ago and we sent him a gift, right? You know, just knowing what's going on in their lives, right? Being friends. And, you know, I joke with them whenever I see some bad things. Like we I literally, uh, the other day I sent something to a broker and I'm like, this is just BS from a different, you know, kind of a price point on a different deal at a different marker. And that broker's laughing because they know the same deal. So, you know, you build rapport. So first thing is really building rapport with the brokers, getting to know them. And, you know, I mean, most brokers are very nice guys. I mean, I actually, it's not, I'm not building the rapport just to build a rapport. They're, I enjoy talking to them. So that's the first and foremost. And then the other half of that equation is, okay, that, that's essentially the trees that we plant, right? Now, all the fruit that's coming in, what do you do with it? And so for us, I mean, we are constantly refining our acquisition pipeline. Right. So, I mean, we have an in-house analyst. We have kind of another person as well that helps with some of the initial stuff. And how do we streamline all of that? And so maybe I'll, I'll pause right there, let you ask a question, then maybe I can kind of talk through more of that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I appreciate that as well. But, you know, you mentioned it being reckless not to go through a broker. And I appreciate you bringing that up because even that's, you know, just increasing that relationship to to get more deal flow, right? I mean, just to go to the next deal and the next deal for them to building that relationship. I like how you mentioned too, like even, you know, that broker even sent you a gift, you know, when you had a child. So it just shows the the time and the um, the energy you've put into that relationship as well. Yeah, and I'll, actually, I'll give you another example of just how much to also respect that broker relationship. So we had a deal that we sold back in October and essentially another broker we have a great relationship with got us an unsolicited offer at a very attractive price point. Now it's attractive price point, but what I did first is I told them, hey, I need to, you know, basically I need two weeks to let the broker that sold me this deal try to get me that same, you know, get me a matching deal, right? And so I tell, I literally had to tell them, hey, just give me two weeks because I wanted to go back to the guy that sold it. I'm like, hey, you know, I know you sold me the deal. I almost always want the person that sold me the deal to sell my deal whenever I'm ready to sell it. We got this unsolicited offer. Here's the price point. Can you get close to this? Right. Just to give them a shot. They respect that. They see that you're, I mean, you know, you are valuing that. Right. And so the brokers want to bring you a deal. Right. And I mean, and it's funny, there's a person that we know that basically he's known as the place where deals go to die because he holds his deals for a long time, which is fine. But from a broker's perspective, right. They're looking at, Hey, you know, I sell a per- this deal, this person, this deal. Can I sell that deal in three, four years? Right. If I have a person that I know is going to hold on to for 20 years or the guy's going to hold on to for five years, who do you think they're going to try to go to? And so kind of just being cognizant of that balance and what they're looking for and how do you maybe help match that? You know, that's a good point that I, I don't think has been made too many times. Just that aspect of if you're a long-term hold buyer, you may not be as likely to get as much deal flow just because brokers want to send it to people who are turning them over and we'll say three to five years or seven, you know? Yeah. So, so something just to kind of be aware of for that. Yeah. So, all right. So then, you know, moving on from, you know, I appreciate you bringing up to like off market deals are not usually really off or most of the time they're not off market deals, uh, but, and then like planting trees and, and bearing the fruit and, you know, it takes some time. Yeah. Right. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, we work hard on just the broker relationships. I mean, we, we have our own team goal of just how do we, you know, continue to build that rapport or that, you know, between gifts and visiting them and, you know, going on site and dividing them out to things. And, you know, we, we, we have a big focus on that piece of it. And uh, you hired an in-house analyst, right? So, you know, tell me about, you know, when did you know you were ready to hire somebody just for that position? Um, whenever we just, <laughs> between Ben and I, we just didn't have the time to, you know, addition to everything else we have going on. I mean, just the company's grown and we just have less and less time to, you know, do the initial underwriting. And I guess, we noticed it once whenever we're getting deals and we're not able to get them answers really quickly. Right. So that's maybe whenever we notice that that problem, like, Hey, we're not able to get them feedback within four days on what our price point would be. Right. Well, that's a problem. So how do we, you know, again, pause, let's break everything apart and rebuild this thing in a, in a way that we know is scalable. So mm, I like but, that. Yeah. All right. So, so now, you know, going on through that acquisition process. Yeah. So I guess, you know, a deal comes in, we've kind of tied it up to where, we get the email, I can forward that into a you know, customized email that we have. And then essentially that will get turned into a task that my analyst will see. And then really we kind of have a couple of different, almost uh, you might call it a Kanban board. And so we have the first kind of pan of all the deals that have come in, 
then, you know, he'll pick those up, go grab all the files. If they're not already in the email and the attachment, you know, kind of get them set up through our, basically our file repository. And then, you know, we've kind of taught him the initial back of the napkin rules of thumb to go through. And then, you know, kind of, he does that really that stiff test. And then deals really fall into two categories. Maybe they work around 75 or better of the ask and maybe they don't. And so for kind of that subset that do work, right. Then, you know, he'll kind of bring it up and then we, you know, I'll kind of do a sanity check. And usually I can snip a deal and kind of get an idea of like, Hey, is this anywhere near the, the realm of what's going on? Or a lot of times I'll call the brokers too and just say, Hey man, all right, let's, let's kind of just straight to the point. Where do we need to be? What's this guy looking for? What are the terms that we need to get this done? Right. Get that kind of initial sense. And then once we have kind of those, we pass those gates, then we actually go in and get the, you know, the deeper underwriting, right? So then he's going to, he's going to go in, start to price out. Okay. What's the tax, you know, currently what's the, you know, what's the price we're buying it at? What should that mill rate be? And kind of, you know, really modeling out all the different pieces just from an expense perspective. And then we kind of have rules of thumb on what to do for income. Right. And then um, once we get through all that, right, I really look at it as essentially phases, right? So once the deals that have made it through all these are not phases, but gates, right. Made it to the last gates. It's just a funnel, right. And, you know, for that last subset, then we start to really hone in, dig in. Then I'm picking up the phone probably for each one of those deals on those brokers and just kind of say, man, hey, I know you wanted 32. I, mean, I did this actually just, just last week. Broker wants 32 and I'm like, we're at 30 and a half. I cannot come up. I'm like, tell me why this deal's worth 32. You know, we kind of go in and, you know, sometimes we, maybe there's some things that we don't know, right? The guy just did a bunch of water savings and we didn't notice that in the last month. And now we have to project that out, right? And, you know, there's some of these things that brokers tell you. And sometimes I'll say, okay. I'll take your word for it, but I put in my LOI that this is contingent on this thing you told me. And so being kind of cognizant of that, because it really, every deal has a story. I mean, it's really true. All of these deals are so different. We've done many deals. Every one of our deals is, all, all, I mean, no deal is alike. I mean, I really can't think of any deal that's alike. Even the painful ones are different than the other painful ones. The really easy ones are different than the really easy ones. And so it's just kind of being aware of that and making sure you can count for that in your model, right? Some good stuff. Uh, so many good points there that you made. Even even just the fact that you're calling the broker and saying, "Okay, let's let's get right to it." Really, I'm not going to waste your time. I don't want you to waste mine. Ultimately, yeah. you know, let's cut right to the chase. What's it going to take? What are the terms? What's expected? Uh, I like that. And and you mentioned too. Um, I see. Yeah, yeah. What was it? Yeah. You, you mentioned like you're you're sending an email. You're doing it in a certain way. So then your analyst knows it. It creates a task. What what what's that system? Yeah. So, I mean, for us, you know, we use a variety of tools. I mean, one, a lot of it's kind of built on top of Asana, right. Is what we're using, but really, you know, we have kind of our weekly call me and the analysts and we just kind of go through what's the pipeline look like today. Everything. Okay. Let's first prioritize these. Let's look at these. Okay. These are not interesting or, you know, I mean, it killed me. So last week we missed out on a deal that I really liked. I mean, gun ho for it. And really the broker just came back. It's like, Hey, they're already kind of negotiating a PSA. And that was just like so frustrating because I really liked that deal. And I'm like, man, that like I thought we dropped the ball because we had a lot going on the past two weeks. And I went back and looked and I'm like, from the time we got the deal, literally heard about the deal from the time we had an LOI in nine days. So it's not like we move very slow at all. I mean, that's still very fast, but clearly it's not fast enough. So my goal now is really getting six days, you know, every one of these deals, we have an LOI out in front of the broker. Right. Because there's other gates that I didn't even talk about of running, just dotting the I's, getting, you know, insurance quotes and kind of yeah. betting on some of these other things. And so depending on how far, but really we're trying to get even quicker. So brokers know us as being quick. I mean, I tell brokers, if you really need to know 48 hours, tell me and I'll, I'll get you an answer what price we're at. And so there's different kind of levers we can pull, but it's even as quickly as we think we are, we still need to refine that and get it down to, you know, a five, six day turnaround tops. I just like the, uh, you know, they just say you're documenting the process. I feel like most people don't even start to document the process, Yeah, you know, and so you can't improve. And then, no, and the other thing too is that that data becomes super valuable. There are so many times a deal comes around nine months later and I'm like, I know this deal. Like, yeah, I swear I know this deal and I poke around, you know, I go search our database and I find it. Boom, there's a deal. Here's where it's at. Okay, they were here and now they're here. What happened, Right. You know, sometimes the price came down. Sometimes the price went up. I mean, sometimes the deal never sold and you realize that the seller is just totally not realistic expectations. And so, you know, as we continue to build that database, I mean, that value, that data is going to be much more valuable. So it'll help to continue to, to your point, right? It will continue to help us grow. Mm. Okay. So now you're, you're documenting all this. You have it in a database where you can search it. Uh, but, you know, you're moving forward with the deal now, uh, you know, unless, or I mean, not one currently, but I mean, just on the show here, we're just talking through kind of your acquisition process. Uh -huh. And yeah, so, so let's go from there. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, once we get an LOI out, get PSA going, you, you know, we lately we've been trying to do more early access just so we can get the thing moving quicker, right? It's sellers. I think a lot of buyers are scared to ask sellers for it. What I'm learning is a lot of sellers, at least the ones where they have the trust of the broker and the broker essentially going to bat for us, right? Sellers just want to get the deal on quicker. And so if you get the early access, that enables everything to move more quickly. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times we try to do the early access, you know, while we're kind of getting a PSA going. And again, we're fast movers, right? So every broker, after we close a deal, I ask every broker, how did we do? And how do you compare us to everyone else? And, you know, my, my, what I want to hear is that you guys are been the best ones, one of the easiest guys to work with. And pretty much that's what I usually hear. <laughs> right. And, you know, I'll dig in on that because really you can't improve if you don't know what you, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. And so, you know, and that includes start to finish, right. Being available, being transparent, getting the team going quickly. So, you know, our PSA, it's fairly, you know, it depends on if the seller starts it or ours, but again, our attorney moves really quickly. We keep the pressure going to get that going. Similarly, right. I mean, we schedule all the due diligence, all the on-sites, you know, really people go, and I tell this to even like family members, don't negotiate for things that you don't need, right. People really try to be super safe and negotiate for everything they can, but all you're going to do is, you know, you have to look at it as you have a very limited set of cards that you can play. And if you're just playing them all, you're not going to get to move forward. And so, you know, if you don't need a 30 day due diligence, why are you doing 30 day due diligence? Right. And I mean, I, I've yet to find anyone that really needed all 30 days, right? So for us, we really start at 21, sometimes 14, and really nine times out of 10, within the first four days, I know if I'm going to buy the property or not, right? Some things you're waiting on other reports, other things to happen. Mm-hmm. But I mean, again, you usually know pretty quickly. So how do you make your offer enticing to stand out against the others? And so in the PSA, there's kind of that tit for tat, right? Kind of finalizing, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And you know, once we've done the due diligence, all that's going, I mean, it's just straight out of the gates. And so from then, at least for us, you know, we, uh, our business, our asset is the investors, right? It's really not the properties, it's the investors and then operations. And so how do you make it easiest for investors, right? Where investors invest with you and they're like, those are the guys I want to invest with because they perform, but also because they just made my life so much easier. And so we're continuously refining that, right? We, 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 uh, we use IMS. Honestly, we haven't been super happy with it. It's not easy enough for most people. And so we're looking at how do we kind of reinvent the process a little bit? How do we make it really white glove? So how do we make things a lot easier? And, you know, through the closing process, right? So that's for the investor side. And then on the other side of the equation too, right? I mean, we are in frequent communication with the brokers, with all the team and just knowing where things are at. And so the brokers, literally they'll text me things and I text them back. I mean, he'll be on an airplane and everyone knows where the deal's going. There's not this weirdness like the last week where no one knows this thing and it closed, right? We've had that maybe once and that was purely seller just not doing anything till two days before closing. Mm. And so it's about, I like to say that I guess syndication is about two things. It's about project management and on steroids really, right? And whenever I was at Microsoft, I was a project manager. And the other part of it too, it's really about essentially being a glorified matchmaker, right? How do you match deals to equity? Right. And so constantly, you know, that's why you're always looking for different equity pools and different deals. And whenever things match, right, you have a deal and then you kind of move forward. And how do you, you know, manage this project through the finish line to closing? And then, I mean, I can go on post-closing. The other thing people need to realize is all the stuff I told you about might sound super hard, right? But it's really not. It's all a process. There's a method to the madness. The hard thing is really what happens after closing. I think people really fixate on closing but you just bought a multi-million dollar, you know, multi-billion, multi-million dollar business. Do you know how to run a business? And so, mm. and I think that's, again, that's another trait that my partner and I have been able to just do well. And we both had businesses prior. We, you know, we know what it takes and kind of how do you build up the right team, staff and systems around that. So, wow. So, you know, uh, before we run out of time, though, you know, I want to say I, re- I really want to get to that closing process and even the, the hard parts after closing, like you're talking about. But maybe we can do another episode and, and focus okay. on that. And uh, but a couple of things there, you know, that you that you mentioned, you know, I don't negotiate for things that you don't need. I, I really like that. You know, it's like focus on 
the it's, important things, right? I mean, <laughs> it's you know, so important and brokers see that. And, you know, and I literally, cause like there's things that there's kind of two categories. There's things that I know I want and there's things that I know I don't want, but they're all things that I still want. All right. Sorry. The things that I don't know, I don't want, I don't want that much. So some of those are in there because I know the broker, the seller will come back and yank that out, but that's fine. He got to have that. I got to keep what I want. But once you show up with, Hey, here's my laundry list of 50 things. I don't really, I'm not trying to piss you off, but here it is. I mean, you're, how likely you think the seller is going to be willing to be flexible, right? So, mm. you know, stick to just what you need and then add a little buffer. Don't start at wanting everything under the sun and try to work down. So Ferris, what's your buying criteria now? I know we mentioned like 100 to 400 units, 10 to 50 million. Um, you know, like what, when you're talking to a broker and they say, what's your buying criteria? What's your response? Man, that's actually a good question because that's honestly changed quite a bit over time. So, and I, and I'm reflecting back on a conversation I had, I think week before last with, you know, a broker that I know, and I'm just, you know, my, my answer to him was essentially like, Hey, right now we're looking at pretty much everything, A's, B's and C's. We have different equity pools that are looking for different things. We've looked at and offered on a, you know, a $35 million A class deal. We've also looked at and offered and I might have an email in midwife today for a deal that we might win. That's uh, you know, a $9 million seventies deal. And so typically we're looking our box. It's, it's almost a tiered box now, right? Cause it's dependent on the asset class. Usually we're looking for being between eight to 12% cash on cash. Right. You know, kind of, I mean, everyone is looking for that, right? 13% to 18% IRR. And it, it, for me though, what's more interesting is about what is the actual, upside how conservative were we pricing it and what's the market and that's the other thing i think people really gloss over so for us you know we've had we, we have three three we've sold we, so last year we had sorry sorry let me backtrack we have three deals in the tertiary market we know that market well we sold two of those deals now right we we, we like tertiary markets but that said there's you know it's a, it's different than a deal in atlanta for example right the thing that people look at is Cash flow in a church chain market is nice, but you have to understand the limited pool of sellers versus like in Atlanta. I mean, you know, there's just a million people looking to buy deals there and all the deals that we've bought there are just worth so much more now than what we paid for them. Right. And so just being cognizant of that. And so we like church, the secondary and church chain market. We've, we've home run it thankfully on all the deals we've sold so far, but again, it's, they're different kind of deals, right? There's not as many buyers and sellers. And so there is something to be said about the value of being in a good market. Right. I mean, I'm really starting to learn that. And then also, too, as we're, we've grown, even the value of being in the right intersection, the right location. Right. Because for us, you know, I tell everyone with the whole team, I'm like, anytime we need to, we all roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty on any part of the business that we need to. Right. And, you know, with the some of these deals can almost can, you know, carry themselves purely based on the location. Whereas the other deals, right, that aren't as good location. Yeah, we got a better price point but we're having to, you know, really monitor the marketing, really monitor the callbacks, really monitor the renewals, right? And, you know, again, those are all systems and processes that you put in place. And, but there's just that, you know, it's that almost like in the back of your mind, like, hey, this is the one I have to really watch, right? It's like having two kids, you know, the one kid that's never problematic and you have the other one that always goes off and, you know, you have to keep an eye on this one is taking 70% of your time. And so, you know, just being more aware, aware of that. And so, Back to your the question, I think that spawned all my thoughts is it's really dependent on the deal location and the asset class. And we're starting to be leery of that. Not all deals are the same. And so for me, my box is kind of a really wonky, you know, probably a hexagon more than it is a box right now. So I, I like the I like the response in the way that like, you know, you're the response to a broker on what your criteria is based on, I mean, it should be, but it's, it's based on where he's at, what location are you actually speaking to, uh, you know, as opposed to, well, this is what it is. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, the other thing too is know the broker you're talking to, right? The broker that's doing the C's is not usually the same broker that's doing the A's. And so that helps a little bit whenever I can kind of tailor the answer to where I'm not having to go off on a five minute period of what I'm looking for. It's a little bit more focused for them. But yeah, I mean, you know, my box is this and I just tell them to send me all the deals that they think might fit. We'll give you quick answers. And so, you know, I try to get more out of them to put the burden on us to, you know, turn around. Is this something we like, area we like and give it back to them. Mm. So Ferris, what's been the hardest part of the syndication journey for you personally? Hardest part of the syndication journey. That's a good question. It's all, 
I mean, it's all challenging. It's got its ups and downs. Um, hardest part is, I guess I'd say it's the, really the first year, right? So for everyone listening to this, the first year of any deal is critical. And on the investor side too, right? The first year is where you give, you know, syndicator slack if you need to. Because again, as a buyer, you don't know what you're going into, honestly. As much due diligence as you might be doing, there's still a lot of unknowns. And so the first year is where a good syndicator can, you know, whip that deal into shape and get it humming, right? And so with that, it's really, it's just the, the first year, right? Just knowing how to handle a deal the first six months. Because again, we've bought deals in multiple markets, right? We're in four markets throughout the country and, you know, different property managers throughout those markets and different tenant bases. And so even within the same market, two different deals that are, we have that are a mile and a half apart perform so differently that first year. And so we've kind of learned on how do, what do we need to be aware of that first six months to really kind of address, don't let issues become a bigger problem later, right? And really the, the core of it boils down to kind of the, you know, you're, there's a, usually you're, I guess I'll tell you the story. So there is kind of an implied agreement between a buyer and seller. So we've been both buyer and we've been seller. We've seen both sides of this, where for a stabilized deal, for those of you that don't know, to get good debt, right, a deal needs to be stabilized. That means 90% or more in occupancy for the past three months. Now, if you're buying a deal that's 90% occupied, right, you got to be careful, right? And because really the seller, there's that implied agreement where the seller is going to do whatever he needs to do to let that deal stay 90%. He might let in someone that he might not have really qualified or screened all the way because, again, getting it at 90% is more important than not because if he doesn't, that's going to blow up the buyer's debt, our debt. And so the seller is doing whatever he needs to do. And me as the buyer, I have to kind of wink to them. It's like, that's fine. Do whatever you need to do. I don't want to know about it. Just do it, right? Just keep the 90% occupancy. Now, that's all great. Now we've closed, but now you just got a property where you don't necessarily know the quality of the tenant base. And so really being leery that first six months of the, you know, what's the delinquency look like, you know, and, and the problem is you take over the property, right? You don't know who's performers and who's not, who the people that are going to give the promises paid and actually deliver and who aren't. Then on top of that, you're probably doing some upgrades and pushing some rents. And then on top of that, you probably have a million dollars of rehab going on around the property. So it's not like the property is amazingly looking at first. There's a lot of chaos, right? And so you need a team on site that can handle all the chaos. You need to be able to handle it as well and understand what's going on, all the dynamics and, you know, what thresholds you need to do, right? Even if you have to take a price uh, rent drop up front, right? Because you're trying to offset the bad people, you know, you try to put them in a six-month lease. And so maybe the hardest part is that because like you see... I've seen so many other syndicators just the deal blows up that six months and now they're paying for for the next two years, right? If you're not Mm -hmm. really careful, because again, a lot of times these leases are one year. So the best case scenario is going to take you a year to fix the problem that you just let go by. And so maybe I'd say that's the hardest part. And how do you put the right systems, checks and balances in place with the team, the property manager, you know, we have an in-house asset manager as well to kind of make sure we all know where we're headed and what are the changes we need to do and be pretty moldable that first six months to get there, right? I think before we used to be a lot more stringent, but you start to learn that actually doesn't pay off, that it backfires. And so just being adaptable and really looking at the first six months on a week by week basis of what's going on, where are we headed? Okay, we have to do this now because of this situation and kind of getting past that. So that's hard too when you're brand new, you know, I mean, you just don't, you don't know what you don't, you don't know. know what you don't know. No, it's absolutely, it's hard. And so it's just, you know, like I said, we have two deals in the same market, one mile apart. It's night and day between these two. And I don't understand it. Honestly, just that first six, that first year was just so different. Right. And it's funny, the newer one is the easier one. That was the one I thought was going to be the harder of the two. And it's like that one, just much better tenant base. I've never had delinquency that low. And so back to my point earlier about, starting to value the quality of the property and the location, right? A property that is 94% occupied versus a property that is 90% occupied. While it seems like it's 4%, it's only a handful of leases, right? That actually makes a huge difference because probably you have a much better quali- quality tenant based on that 94% because the seller never needed to let that bar slip because they're already humming. So kind of something to be aware of, right? Even me as a buyer now, I'm really looking for that. For deals that are right on that cusp, you want to kind of keep that in the back of your mind that there's probably a, a clean out that you need to do. And I'll give you an example. One of the deals that we had in Atlanta that we sold back in November, you know, this deal, we bought it. I remember touring it with my property manager before we bought it. And he said, you're probably going to have, you know, 50% turnover on this deal. I'm like, no way is it going to be that high. And it was, I mean, we knew it was a complete turnaround property, but sure. And behold, a year later we had, you know, 50% turnover. We had cycled out all 
you know, completely cleaned house on that from just getting rid of all the non-performers, all the drug dealers, all of kind of the really the problematic issues because it was like the rough property in a good, in a decent area. Just cycling through that and now kind of seeing the hum along. And so just being leery of what that first year is going to entail. And then, nice. you know, and continuous. And the other thing maybe I'll add to that is you see a lot of guys will buy one or two deals and then just get burdened off, right? They, they get completely overwhelmed. You know, it takes a while to get through. And so how do you get ahead of that and continue to scale and grow as well? Mm. Wow. So much great content there, Ferris. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, but, you know, it, I hope that you'll agree to do another show and we can focus Always on happy to. Anytime the closing want. process and some of the uh, the hard parts after closing like, uh, that we were talking about. And then, uh, and there's uh, many other questions that I wanted to ask you. But, uh, uh, but tell us how you like to give back before we have to go. Oh, man, I'm happy. Like I tell my investors, feel free to reach out to me, you know, with questions or anything we can help with. I mean, my partner and I both try to make ourselves super available right? Maybe I'm going to regret this in the future, but today, you know, we're happy to help answer questions, happy to help partner with people as needed. So that's kind of a big thing we like to do, especially if you have questions on that first six months, right? What are the, the ups and downs? I mean, feel free to reach out. It's better to ask a question, at least try to ask a question, than pay for it for the next year. For sure. And, and how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, disruptequity.com or uh, Ferris, F-E-R-A-S at disruptequity.com. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.